then when it opens on the end, because it's very likely that Kristen will cover your questions as she makes her way through the presentation. I just want to remind everybody, just based on some of the feedback that we've gotten this week, that your benefit options are just that. They are options. You are able to pick the plan that fits best for you and your needs, and our mission here today is to explain those options to you so that you can pick the right one. So keep in mind, they are options, and you have many, and hopefully we'll be able to help you with your decision-making process. Kristen is going to be recorded, so she will be stationary at the podium because of the recording. And uh, that's really about it. So welcome and thank you. Can you All right, start? thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Christine. So as Christine mentioned, my name is Kristen, and this is Christine as well. So if you get confused, Chris, Kristen, Christine, whatever works best for people. <laughs> so we are from Gallagher Benefit Services. We partner with the district for health insurance purposes. We're going to go through all of the options. Um, and you, many of you may, may already know who Gallagher is because we have an advocacy service that you can contact should you have any questions with the current plans or anything that we're going over today. So the first thing that we're gonna start with um, is open enrollment and really what that means. So open enrollment is an opportunity for employees to make changes to your benefits. So you can change your medical plans, enroll or drop coverage, um, add, change, or delete dependents, children and or spouses. Um, and you cannot do so any other time during the year unless you have a qualifying life event. So during the period of May 20th to June 14th is the open enrollment time frame where you're going to go on and elect your benefits. Um, all of the benefits are going to be effective from September through August, September 1st, 2019 through August 31st, 2020, um, with the exception of the flexible spending account, which runs from July to June. We did include the district self-service website. I'm pretty sure that everyone is very aware of how to go on and, and, and enroll. Um, employees who are not making changes will just go into the system and, and re-elect their benefits. And some of you have to go in because the benefits are changing depending upon what union group you belong to. So now we're gonna get into the fun stuff, the medical plans. So I'm gonna start with um, an overall overview of all of the plans. So there are four different plans offered under um, the Education Association as well as Act 93. There are three plans, the Personal Choice C3, F101, which is currently also in place, and then two new plans, the Personal Choice C4, F302, or the Personal Choice HD1, HC1. Um, and then the support staff have um, two plans, one of which is already, um, it, it, we already mentioned, the C3 F101 and the 203070. So those plans are not changing. So all four of these plans have um, the following in common. They're all PPO plans, so they offer national coverage. There is no primary care physician election required, no referrals required. They all have the same network of benefits and the same benefit category. So they all cover preventive care at 100%. They all offer both in and out of network coverage. Um, and they all offer unlimited lifetime maximum. So there's no cap on the coverage that you receive. So when selecting a plan, since all of the plans do have national coverage and have all of these things in common, the key component when making a selection is cost. And that's cost that's coming out of your paycheck, as well as cost of when you go to the doctor, hospital, or pharmacy. So this is a little bit challenging to see, and I'll go through um, this one by one. But there are two new plan options that are going to be offered to the Education Association, as well as Act 93. Um, the personal choice C3 F101 is all the way to your right. That plan is in place currently. That plan is not changing, so it will remain at $20 for an office visit and $40 for a specialist visit. Inpatient hospitalization is 100% covered, and the emergency room is a $100 copayment. This goes through um, the outpatient radiology, outpatient surgery. You can see outpatient surgery is covered at 100%. 
All of three of the benefit programs, again, offer the same exact benefit. So it's really the cost that um, changes from plan to plan. Um, there are two new programs that we're introducing. The one of them uh, is the blue highlighted one in the middle, and that is similar to the plan that I just went over. It's called the Personal Choice C4 F302. And that what that plan offers is um, the same, very similar approach to the current plan, except slightly higher co-payments. So under this plan, there's office visits at your primary care for $30 and specialists for $50. Um, the inpatient hospitalization is $150 copayment per day, um, but with a max of five copayments. So if, if, if you're in there for five days or for 10 days, you still pay that max of five copayments. The emergency room is covered at 100%. I mean, the emergency room, excuse me, is covered at $100 copayment. Um, outpatient surgery is a $75 copayment. Under this program, the specialist visits, specialist cost is what you pay for the physical occupational speech therapy as well as chiropractic care. So if you're someone that utilizes those services a lot, you want to take a look at that cost to see if it makes sense for you. I'm going to move on to the first plan all the way to the left. And this is called the HD1 HC1, also known as the H HSA qualifying plan. So this plan is very different than what we're, we're typically used to. This plan has an upfront deductible and none of the services are covered until that deductible is met. This plan offers a lower cost out of your paycheck. So when you take a look at the per pay cost that comes out of your paycheck, this is going to cost you the least amount out of your paycheck, but there is an upfront deductible. This plan is paired with an account called an HSA or a health savings account. That health savings account is very similar to the flexible spending account, except it's a savings account, not a spending account. So what that means is that you can use the, the monies in this account that will be established for you if you enter into this plan to pay for some of your upfront costs. The district will be funding half of the deductible. So the deductible is $1,500 for any single employee and $3,000 for anyone covering a dependent or dependent. So if you have one child, um, you, you are subject to the $3,000 deductible. And if you have five children and a spouse, you're subject to the $3,000 deductible. The account that's set up established alongside of this is called a Health Savings Account, or HSA. And as mentioned, the district will be funding $750 for single employees and $1,500 for anyone covering a dependent. Those monies go into this account so that when you go to the doctor, the pharmacy, or the hospital, you can use those monies um, for services. Because as you can see here, all of the in-network medical services are covered, are, are subject to the deductible. So that means when I go to the doctor or the hospital, I'm no longer paying a $20 copayment. I'm paying the discounted cost of that service. So it's very likely under this plan, if you go to the doctor, that you're going to be subject to um, $100 and yeah, three and 33 cents. It's typically not an even amount. It's the discounted cost of the service. And again, you use those funds on your card to pay for those services. So a health savings account was established years ago, and it's really meant for individuals to save for retirement purposes. The money stays in your account, and it rolls over from year to year. You don't lose it like the flexible spending account, but it must be paired with a, a deductible plan. So the IRS states it has to be paired with a deductible plan, and that's why the health savings account is only available um, with this deductible option. We're gonna get into a little bit more specifics on this plan um, because I know that that's different than what we're currently used to, but um, at this point in time, I'd like to just go through the medical plans offered to the support staff. So the plans for the support staff are not changing. The C3F101 is remaining in place and the 203070 plan is remaining in place. So the office visits are $20 
um, under both plans. Under the C3 F101, the specialists are $40, and the 203070, the specialist is $30. Again, when we say specialist, that applies to physical, occupational, and speech therapy. That's the specialist copayment, as well as um, chiropractic care or spinal manipulation. Um, and there are certain limitations on those plans as well that um, we would recommend that you take a look at. But if you are, that's the big difference between these two plans is the specialist copayment. Also want to take a look at the inpatient hospitalization under the C3F101 plan. That's covered at 100%. And under the 203070 plan, it's $150 per day copayment in the, in the hospital. Again, that maximum is five copayments. Um, so if you go into the hospital for a longer period of time, you're only subject to the five copayments. Um, under the um, outpatient surgery, that's covered at 100% under the C3F101. And under the personal choice 203070, it's covered at $150 copayment. We're starting to see more and more outpatient surgeries, which you go in um, and you come out the same day. So maybe you have a, a knee surgery where you're going in and coming out the same day. If you stay overnight, that is typically an inpatient expense as opposed to outpatient. So um, under this plan, if I were deciding between the two plans, um, one of the biggest things are the copayments, um, at primarily the specialist copayment because the primary care physician copayment remains at $20 for both plans. So you want to take a look at the specialist. And then, of course, you want to take a look at what's coming out of your paycheck. These plans are very similar um, as far as the cost. And you can see that there are some slight variations um, the emergency room under the personal choice C3F101 is a $100 copayment. Under the 203070, it's a $40 copayment. Under all of these plans, urgent care is also covered. So keep that in mind that you do have an alternative to emergency, um, and that is at urgent care. And that cost is typically 70% of the emergency room cost. So under the C3F101, that cost is $70 for urgent care. And under the personal choice 203070, the cost is $28. <clears throat> We're going to get into more now about the HSA qualifying plan. And this is that plan that is offered to um, the Education Association as well as Act 93. Um, the plan is Independence Blue Cross's. Naming conventions are a little bit confusing, but the plan is called HD1, HC1. Um, internally at the district, we call it the HSA qualifying plan. So um, under this plan, as mentioned, there's a $1,500 single deductible, $3,000 for anyone covering dependents. During the deductible phase, members pay 100% of the discounted eligible expenses up to the plan's deductible. So if you're a single, um, employee and you enrolled in single coverage, you're subject to a $1,500 deductible. After the $1,500 is met, all in-network medical services are covered at 100%. But keep in mind that you have a card very similar to your own personal debit card that will have half of the deductible amount funded on the card. So if you're a single employee, you'll have $750 on a card that you can use when you're going for doctor's office visits and lab work. And what um, I recommend is that employees take a look at the cost of each of the plans because the cost of this particular plan is quite low. That's coming out of your paycheck compared to the other plans. So the thought process is that you can put some of that money aside to save for medical expenses. So you can also contribute to the health savings account. Very similar to the flexible spending account, you get a pre-tax savings um, so if you take a look at the cost of the benefit, it's probably less than what you're even paying today for your health care. So if you do some math, you might even be able to cover the entire the deductible and still be ahead of what you're paying currently. I know it's a little bit confusing because it's a really, it's, a, it's kind of cost shifting. It's a different approach to expenses and medical care. Although this is considered a deductible program, it's a very rich deductible. So it's a 1,500, 3,000, which is fairly low. 
And then after that, everything's covered at 100%. A lot of other deductible plans have a higher deductible, and then there you still have to pay some expenses after the deductible is met. Now, another thing that you have to keep in mind with this plan is that prescription drug has to be included in the deductible, and that's an IRS requirement in order to pair it with this health savings account. So when you go to go pick up your prescription drugs under this plan, again, you're going to be paying the discounted cost of the prescription up until the deductible is met. So anyone that typically moves into this plan is very surprised to see what the cost of prescriptions are because unfortunately they have skyrocketed. But the good thing with this particular plan is you really know what your out-of-pocket expense exposure is because that deductible is that $1,500 or $3,000. After that point, all medical services are covered at 100%. And the only thing you'd be responsible for are prescription drug co-payments. It reverts them back to the prescription drug copayments. This particular plan really requires some thought and some calculations behind the scenes to make sure it makes sense for you. After the deductible is the coinsurance phase. Most, um, most of you don't have to worry about this coinsurance phase because the med in, after the deductible is met, the medical is covered at 100%. So if I went into the hospital and I got several prescriptions and I met my 1500 and I'm enrolled in a single and then I had was admitted into the hospital again, that would be covered at 100% for the remainder of the plan year. The only thing that you have to pay for after the deductible is met is prescription drug copayments. So in during the deductible phase, you pay the discounted cost of the prescriptions, and then after that point, you pay the applicable copayment. Another thing to just further confuse this plan, unfortunately, is there is something called an out of pocket maximum. This is a result of health care reform. Every plan has to have an out of pocket maximum. Unfortunately, out of pocket maximums were really not meant for plans like the district has. They're meant for more catastrophic type coverage where you're paying a percentage of the cost of medical care. So for example, my plan, I have a $6,000 deductible and then my coverage is only 70% after that. So the out-of-pocket maximum is very important to me because um, it, without that, I would not know what my maximum exposure is. On the plans that you have, there's really no need for an out-of-pocket maximum because you'll never reach that amount because your benefits are so rich. We just wanted to make you aware of this number because it is listed on the benefit summary because it has to be as a result of health care reform. But it really doesn't mean anything because after you reach the deductible, all medical services are covered at 100%. The only thing that will apply to the out-of-pocket maximum at that point is prescription drug copayments. And I have never seen someone receive that many prescription drug copayments that would ever reach. Um, basically, you'd have to have $4,000 in prescription drug copayments for the remainder of the year to ever reach that out-of-pocket maximum. So if you don't fully understand this, this, it's okay. It's just something that you really can disregard, the out-of-pocket maximum. <clears throat> so this gets into the account component of the plan. So with the deductible plan, you have the deductible plan, and then you have a separate account. And it, the account looks just like a bank account you get an actual debit card in the mail. It's a PNC debit card. And again, you, that will be funded with half the deductible on there. Any monies you would like to contribute, you are able to do so as well. The purpose of the health savings account was established years ago. And initially, we saw these plans really put into place um, for um, high income earners that were trying to save for retirement as um, and receive tax benefits. So this is an employee owned account. So once this account is in your name, it's your account. If you take this plan and then leave, that money does go with you. It's your money in that account. The eligibility 
is all of these things are set up again by the IRS. So these are not district decisions. This is this is IRS um, regulations. So the eligibility members must be enrolled in a qualified high deductible health plan. And you are not able to have Medicare. Um, it, you're not able to be enrolled in Medicare and receive contributions. So if you are still working and you're 65 or older, um, you are able to um, postpone Medicare eligibility if you want to stay in the active plan. And anyone that needs assistance with this, we can help on the back end because um, this is a very strict IRS guideline that you cannot be enrolled at Medicare. So now a lot of times Medicare Part A, ha automatically you get enrolled and there are some tax consequences with that. So we just wanna make sure that everyone's aware of that. We can help as well. Anyone can contribute to this account. So the employer and the employee, the district is contributing $750 for single employees and anyone covering a dependent, 1,500. The big question we always get asked is, can these funds be carried over year to year? The answer is yes. The account is portable. So again, if you left today, you can take any monies that you have earned thus far with you and you can use them for future healthcare expenses. Now, if you use them for non-health expenses, you're able to do so, but there is a penalty and the penalty is an, an, an attack. So we obviously never recommend that, but you are able to do so. There is a maximum that you can contribute from an IRS perspective. For 2019, the maximum is 3,500 for individual and 7,000 for anyone covering a dependent. Those that are 55 or older can contribute an additional $1,000. And the reason for that is because um, this again is meant for saving for retirement. So uh, the IRS is giving um, those that are 55 and above the opportunity to contribute as much as they want from a um, tax-free perspective um, until they reach age 65. In addition, you can invest these funds if you want to. So PNC, if you do enroll in this plan, you'll automatically be enrolled in the, with this account. And PNC will send you information once your account reaches $500, which everyone who enrolls will automatically have at least $750. You'll be able to invest those funds if you would like to. You don't have to, but it is an option. The one um, big criteria with this is you cannot have a flexible spending account and a health savings account because that would be considered double, double tax benefit for the employee. So the real benefits of the health savings account is there, it's a triple tax saving. So contributions to your HSA are tax free and they lower your taxable income. So if you do that calculation that I was recommending earlier and you decide I would like to put $30 per paycheck into my health savings account, that money comes out of your account, of your paycheck tax-free into your account. Um, you can pay for, you, you can use your HSA to pay for eligible medical expenses and you won't be taxed on that withdrawal. And then if you invest, the interest earned is not taxed either. There's a ton of HSA eligible expenses. It's very similar to the flexible spending account expenses. And there's a list here um, on the IRS website that you can go to, but it's pretty much all of the standard medical prescription. You can use it for dental, for vision. Um, it's very, very similar to the flexible spending account. And the purpose of these plans is really to put, um, to put the, the onus on the consumer. So now you're thinking about where you're going for healthcare because you have a, a, a fund of money that you essentially want to save for the future, but it's there if you need it. Then once you reach um, 65 or you leave, um, you can use these HSA dollars, you can use them for premiums. So you can use them for COBRA premiums. Um, once you, the real purpose of them is to save for when you're 65 or older, to use them for certain Medicare premiums. Um, Long-term care is a, is a big one, um, and, and you can use that for that as well. So um, there's a lot of benefits from a long-term perspective of this. And I, I, I encourage everyone to kind of take a look at the cost 
of this program if you're interested in it that comes out of your paycheck because again rather than paying for a plan that you may or may not use you're contributing towards an account that is yours for your health care expenses it may not be right for everyone but there may be some people that this is a good fit for now we're going to get into the prescription drug program so for the Educational Association and for Act 93, the co-payments are $10 for generic, for a preferred brand it's 30, and for non-preferred brand it's a $50 co-payment. For 90-day supply, it's two co-payments. And the great thing with um, the CVS Caremark contract is you don't have to get a 90-day supply through mail order. You can go to a CVS retail pharmacy and obtain a 90-day supply there. Um, so I know that mail order some people don't like and you don't have to use it and still save one copayment um, for, for three months by getting a 90 day supply. There are some other ways to save from, from a prescription perspective as well. Um, if, of course, we always recommend taking generics if possible. It's not always possible. Um, but there are certain generic programs. For example, Walmart and Wegmans, they have programs outside of the insurance company where it's $4 for generics and it's $10 for a 90-day supply. So that's something good to look into as well. Um, if there's ever a medication that uh, is unaffordable or is not covered, you can also contact our advocacy department and we can help to see if there's a manufacturer program. We've been successful in doing that where there are certain medications that are quite costly and um, and perhaps excluded or unaffordable. And you always see on TV the commercials that say if you need help paying for this prescription, um, there is available funds. So we are able to help with that as well. At the bottom, there are resources. There is a mobile app. If anyone wants to um, enroll in the mobile app, we, we do encourage that. Um, I think in the future we're going to start seeing everything used through your phone similar to um, when you go to the airport and you, you no longer need a printed ticket, you just use your phone. So as long as your phone doesn't die quickly, you'll be okay. For the support staff, the co-payments are $10 for generic, $20 for brand, $35 for non-formulary brand, and then for specialty medicines, it's $50. Again, it's two times the co-payments for a 90-day supply. And again, I recommend if you're on an ongoing maintenance medication to try using the, either, either the mail order or going to CVS retail pharmacy and picking up that 90-day supply because it saves not only you money, but the plan money as well. And then finally, there are these clinical utilization management programs in place for the um, Education Association and Act 93 members. Um, these only impact a, um, a small amount of drugs, and um, in most cases, you probably don't even know that it's happening behind the scenes. But for example, prior authorization is an authorization on a medication to ensure that it is meant for your specific condition. Um, it's very similar to receiving an authorization on the medical side for an MRI. That's all done behind the scenes, and you're probably not even aware of it, but we're seeing this now on the pharmacy side. Um, step therapy is where there are certain medications that have lower costing equivalents, um, usually a generic um, that you have to try first. Any of these programs, if you are at all impacted, you will receive a letter in the mail to let you know, but it's a very small number of people that are impacted, and in most cases, things are done behind the scenes, so you don't even know that it's happening. Um, and drug quantity management. These are just limiting um, the quantity of medication with FDA approved guideline dosages. And an example of this is um, for pain medicines. Um, for, I take migraine medication. I'm able to get nine pills a month because if I take more than nine pills a month, that means I'm getting a migraine more than nine times a month and there may be something more severe happening. So again, in most cases, you probably aren't even aware that these things are happening behind the scenes, but there are these clinical programs in place really protecting the plan. And the last um, section is the flexible spending account. So effective July 1st, the medical flexible spending and dependent care accounts will transition from security benefits to TriStar. 
Um, and that, um, and that uh, there also is an additional benefit starting with the new plan year of July 1st, 2019, you'll be able to roll over $500 of your unused funds at the end of the plan year. So if you're someone that's not planning on enrolling in the deductible plan and you're a little bit nervous about enrolling the flexible spending, um, just know that at the end of the year, if you don't use $500 of your funds, you are able to roll them over, which is um, historically not how the plan has been set up. But just a reminder that employees cannot have both the flexible spending account and the health savings account. I mentioned this earlier, um, Gallagher offers a team of people um, to answer any type of questions related to the plans, anything that we went over today. Um, if you simply lost your ID card and need a new ID card, they're there to help. So this is their both their email address as well as the 800 number. If you have a number or an email that you're, or a contact that you've been working with, feel free to continue using this. This is the general email that goes to the team of people. Um, anything that we went over today, if you need help selecting a plan, if you leave here today and say, I really don't know what she was talking about related to that deductible plan, give them a call and they're there to help. The one thing I will say, regardless of if you're um, enrolled now or in the future, if you ever get a bill in the mail you don't understand, before you pay it, give them a call. Um, there are errors done in billing and it's a lot easier for, to help, for us to help before it's paid than for us to try and get your money back. But we are there um, to do nothing but help and support you and navigate you through, through the benefit offerings. And just a reminder that um, open enrollment starts next Monday. Um, and we, we do um, ask that everyone goes into the system and makes their elections for the new plan year. And the changes will be effective September 1st, 2019 through August 31st, 2020. Okay. Okay. Um, so now is the time to answer questions. So, yes. Uh, pretty easy with that. The, the first one is if an employee decides to take the waiver because they don't want the so if the employee if an employee selects um, the waiving option a cash buyout option are they still eligible to oh okay just waiving benefits um, are you still able to take dental vision um, FS and the answer is yes you can continue um, the medical and the prescription are separate so if you waive out of that you can take the medical the dental vision and FSA was I had an issue, and it's not specific, but it came out with the issue of usual and customary charges versus the high deductible plans. If I go to my doctor and he charges once to charge $120 and the UC is $80, do I have to pay the difference if it's no, so the question is, I'm sorry, I have to remember to uh, repeat the question. So the question is that um, if the doctor says that the bill is $100 and the insurance company is saying that the usual and customary is $80, what do you have to pay? So that's a situation where you're not going in network. So as long as you continue to remain in network, you'll never run into that issue. Yeah, so when you're out of network, what happens is that, doc I'm, I'm assuming this happened in dental. Okay, so all of these plans do cover national coverage, and if you're in an emergency situation, it's always considered a network. So if that's the case, I'd like to you know take a look at the bill. But when you go out of network, those doctors, dentists, hospitals are not have no contract with Independence Blue Cross or MetLife. Therefore, they can charge you whatever you want. You have no protection. So we always recommend staying in network if possible. We understand. That's part of your out of network deductible, which doesn't go to anything in network. But you can still use your health savings account if you would like to. But again, we don't recommend going out of network unless you have to. And, uh, my last question was um, if I go to the doctor to get an annual checkup and then under that examination, they send me to go get blood work and other tests, are they considered separate? 
Or so the so under, the question is, if I go to the doctor and I am then sent for blood work, is that considered separate procedures? And you, what, what happens under the deductible plan is you pay the discounted cost for the overall services. So if you're going to the doctor, um, you pay their, whatever they submit for their discounted cost. And a good way to obtain what that cost is, is you can take a look at current explanation of benefits. So if you look at your current explanation of benefits, it'll have a charge amount which you can pretty much ignore. And then it'll have the amount the insurance company paid. That's what you would be responsible for if you select the deductible plan. So if you go for a preventative care visit, preventative care is always covered at 100% even in the deductible situation. However, there are a couple, there are a couple stipulations to that. Um, and the colonoscopy is a good example. So if you go in and you get a routine colonoscopy and they find a polyp, that then switches to diagnostic and is no longer covered at 100%. It really is up to how the doctors are submitting um, their coding. So preventive care is always covered at 100% until unless it changes to diagnostic. So if you were going to get your preventive care and then they said, we, we see something, we want you to come back, we want you to get lab work, then that, that is no longer covered at 100%, that portion of it. You're welcome. Yes. Um, so the uh, 15, so if you're a family, you get $1,500 in the district, does that, do you get that at the beginning? Do you get that on September 1st on part? So the question is, um, if you are a family and you are subject to the $3,000 deductible and you receive $1,500 from the di district, when do you receive that money on the card? And you will receive that about the first week in September um, because it, you cannot fund a health savings account until the person is enrolled. So after September 1st is when, it, right around September 1st is when the funding will take place and it's usually two, two to three business days. So it'll take about a week for the funding to actually get into your account. Now keep in mind that it should not, that should not impact anything. The only thing that you have to pay for under the deductible plan at point of sale is the prescriptions. So when you go to the doctor, if you're in that deductible plan, you do have to show them your new ID card, and then they're going. The doctor is going to say, "Okay, you have a deductible. You will be billed." They submit everything to Blue Cross, and then they send you a bill in the mail about a month later. So there's about a month or two lag time before you ever even have to make payment using that card. You don't pay a time of service because it's a it's a, a discounted amount that Independence Blue Cross. It's there. You no longer pay a copayment. What about the other fifteen hundred? Does that come out of the paycheck or? Um like how do you deposit the money into the HSA? So the other 1500 um, the question is what happens um, if you, as the employee, want to make contributions? You can make an election during open enrollment similar to your flexible spending account where you're electing what you want to come out per pay. You can even go on to the portal, um, to the Blue Cross portal. There's a separate spending account tab and fund your health savings account if you want to, but the way to receive the pre-tax savings is to do it through payroll contributions. So um, you, you want to take a look at the cost of this particular plan, what you're currently paying, and then see how much you can afford to put into that health savings account. So if you decide to contribute zero and then you get the $1,000 deductible, that 1500 wouldn't be tax free unless somehow you can write it off on your taxes. You yes, you could you can you can write that off on your taxes at tax time. Yep. Or you can determine that you want to fund your HSA at that point in time if you want to. Okay. The other question I had was um, if you take the H D the HSA plan and you and you cannot have an FSA plan, how does that affect um the penny care? So the question is, if you take the, the HSA qualifying plan, um, how does that affect dependent care? And it does not. So you are, I should have stipulated that, so that's a good, that's a good question. You are able to continue the dependent care. You just cannot take the medical flexible spending so account. separate FSA for dependent Correct. Okay. Yes? In the chance retirees, that's receiving the less than retirees, that's how we've done our enrollment. <laughs> is that how it can be personal also? 
Yeah, so um, in the past, retirees have received a letter from Gallagher to make their enrollment changes, and that is going to happen as well. Again, keep in mind that the enrollment changes do not take place till September 1st. So there is a little bit of time, but you will definitely receive the same exact material as prior years to make your election with all the same information. Um, within the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll, we'll be sending that out. And are the retirees also eligible for all these it just depends on which particular uh, group you're in. So if you are a, 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 a educational association retiree, RAC 93 association retiree, then you would be eligible for the new plans. If you're not, that then you stay with the current plans if you're in the support staff. But there's no one's funding the half of the deductible though, right? No, yes, yes. The, 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 no. 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 Right. <laughs> I apologize. Yes. Yes. Is half of the deductible for the plan just for free network? Correct. So the question is, is half of the deductible for retire? Well, actually, no. So is half of the deductible that's funded in your account, you can use that for whatever you want. So the district is funding. Um, if you're a single, 750. If you're a family, three, uh, 1500. Is that the limit that they? Out of out of network. But again, um, I would say that the the district has 99% in network utilization. So. It's the high deductible plan is not meant to go out of network. I would not recommend if you are someone that goes out of network and out of network, keep in mind, does not mean out of area. You have national coverage. So if you, uh, you know, God forbid, had a, a bad diagnosis and wanted to see a specialist in New York State, you could. This plan offers national, it actually offers worldwide in network coverage. But if you're seeing, if you're actually going to someone that does not participate with Independence Blue Cross, I would not recommend the high deductible. Program. It's a five thousand dollar single. Yep, ten thousand. It is not. It is not meant to go out of network. No, because again, it is not meant to go out of network. Yes. So next, so this year I put in fifteen hundred dollars. I don't use any. Next year, am I re rolling fifteen hundred more dollars? So I have a total of three thousand, or am I not putting anything in? It's still good for this year. So the fifteen hundred dollars doesn't go away if you don't use it. You can have it, and then whatever the is the but district funding. Now that pay next year, it's still fifteen hundred. Am I adding to that now? I have to count three thousand. So next year, your union agreement says that you go down to twenty five percent of the deductible, and that's added to. They don't look into what your account balance has now, and that's why it's a benefit to the employee because that once that money is deposited to you, it's your money. They can't. You, they won't even know what your balance is. Yes? Um, can you speak to the fees associated with the HSA? And there's a fee with the FSA. Is there a fee with the HSA? That's my question. Are we spending money? There is a fee, um, and a monthly administrative fee to the um, HSA. Uh, I believe it's very similar to the flexible spending account. Um, it's, I think, $3.50 per, per month. But it's not per transaction, just per month. Per month Correct. Per Yes. If folks were looking to educate themselves in terms of um, the FSA and the HSA and they were looking for a list of prescription costs, is there something like that now just to get an idea of Sure. So the question is if, if you're looking to educate yourself and get an idea of what prescription costs actually cost. Um, as opposed to the co-payments, where do I go? Um, there is a website called goodrx.com, and you can go in there and enter um, any prescription that you have, and they'll give you the top five pharmacies in the area um, that cover it at the different prices, because pharmacies do price things out slightly differently. But that'll give you an idea of what the cost is without, without insurance. Good, G-O-O-D-R-X, all one word, dot com.
Yes. You mentioned the cost of each of the programs. Where do we see the cost of it? The cost is on the employee self-service website. It's posted as well as, as in there. And you definitely do need to take that into consideration when selecting a plan, how much money comes out of your pack. The retirees will be sent something in the mail um, within, within the next month of what the cost of the programs are. The question that came up regarding retirees and the HSA contribution, there will be further follow-up to that. There are specific restrictions once a person reaches age 65 and is enrolled in Medicare, they are no longer uh, able to participate in a health savings account. But watch out for further information. We will provide clarification on um, for those retirees that are under age 65. I'm going to go to some people that haven't. Yeah? The HSA, where is the money you said it was PNC? What kind of savings account? It's an interest bearing account. It's called a health savings account. If you Google it, you can get the information. But um, it's a very specific IRS run account, very similar to the flexible spending account. PNC has different mutual funds that you are able to invest in. Um, you can get your own health savings account with your own banking institution if you want to. We typically don't recommend that because then we don't have access to help. The employer doesn't have access to fund. Mm -hmm. No. Since it's pre-tax dollars, does that count against your maximum contribution to the 403B? And the answer is no. Yes. Um, are you going to get more than one debit card for a family, or are you going to get one card? Uh, for if you are enrolled in the high deductible plan, how many debit cards do you get? You receive two cards, and you can order more cards. However, I will tell you to, if you have college kids, I understand that they need a card, but make sure they understand what the purpose of that card is, because it, it can be used for anything, but there are tax consequences if you use it for non-medical expenses. The other question I have, let's say next year I go to the high deductible plan, and I have an HSA account. But the following year, I go back to the sheet for the plan. Am I allowed now to use my, uh, my debit card for co-payments? Yes. Yeah. So the question is, if I enroll in the deductible plan with the health, health savings account this year, and then next year I enroll back to the co-payment plan, can I use my health savings account for the co-payment plan? And the answer is yes. You are able to. You are just no longer able to receive contributions or make contributions to that account. You can save it for the future for long-term care premiums, um, for, for retirement premiums, or you can use it for your current co-payments, or you can invest it. It's, it is your money. Yes? So the question is, when do you receive a debit card with a PIN number? And I actually should have, that's a, that's a good clarifying question as well. There is no PIN associated with the account, so it's more like a credit card. Um, and so there's no, there's no PIN associated with it. But again, you receive two cards and can determine who, who can be on the, that account, who can receive those. You can also pay other ways. You don't have to use the card. It's just most convenient to do so. Yes? So the question is, if you're a CRESPA retiree, how to how what happens once we once an agreement is reached? So currently, what we're doing is we're enrolling status quo, and we're going to do that for the retirees. And then once an agreement is reached, if things do change for year one, then we'll do the enrollment process over again. Yes. Um, I just to clarify for the deductible, it's $3,000 per person or for everyone? Just to clarify for the deductible, is $3,000 per person or for everyone? It covers everyone. So if you meet the $3,000 or your spouse only meets the $3,000, everyone is covered after that point. Correct. Correct. So the question is, where does the fifteen hundred dollar funding come from? And that comes from the district. Okay. Yes. Um, currently, there's a wage option for hundred dollars a month for spouses, mm -hmm. um, and both couples enroll in this program and get hundred dollars as a separate benefit. 
No. No, that's double dipping. You, you, the question is, can if there you have a spouse that works here, can you both enroll in single and both get the fifteen hundred? The, the the answer is no. You would if you both enrolled in single, you would each get seven fifty. You get half of the deductible amount. Does that make sense? Sure. So you can, we get 1500 for total, but I don't think we allow, we don't allow, uh, I believe for those that are, we only allow one one enrollment, right? You can't, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think you're gaining anything from that by doing that, if I can think. <laughs> yes? Yeah, just a clarification from the last question there about the $3,000 on the deductible. On the plan rider that I have that was downloaded from ESS, uh, under the deductibles, it says, I'll read the whole thing, single deductible, out of pocket maximum, you already showed applies to self only contracts, family contracts, uh, blah, blah, blah. No family member will be subject to more than the single out of pocket maximum shown above. So, does that mean that if you have a husband, spouse, and two kids, that the husband can pay up to a maximum of 1500 and then that has met the deductible, and then kid could pay 750 and then wife could pay the other 750, and that would meet it. But if, if, if one member had a $3,000 bill, 1500 is paid out of pocket, and then the other 1500 picks up because it says the single for one individual person. So the question is, um, if the, with, with regards to the deductible for the 3000 for family, so I'll, I'll just, I'll, rather than going through the question, I'll explain how it works. I'll take a look at what that language says, but again, since this is paired with a health savings account, the $3,000 applies to, if, to anyone covering a dependent. And regardless of if one person in the family or all people in the family contribute to it, $3,000 must be met in order for the deductible to be satisfied. So I'll take a look at that language there and we'll get that fixed if that's incorrect, but that's an IRS regulation. So again, it's a $3,000 total deductible and um, regardless of if you met 1500 and someone else met 750, you had not met your deductible yet. Yes. I have a question about um, with retirees. I know you said there's more information coming, but if a retiree opts into the HSA qualifying plan, can they make contributions as long as they're under age 65? Then? Yeah, so the question is, um, if you are a retiree, can you make contributions if you're under age 65 to the HSA qualifying plan? And the answer is yes. Um, there, is a, there is a portal where you can make contributions, or um, there are forms that we can help you with to make contributions as well. Um, so we can assist with that. Yes? I have a couple questions. Can retirees have a spending account? Um, the question is, can, our, can retirees have a flexible spending account? And no, that is just available to actives. And part of the reason, too, is because it comes out of your paycheck on a pre-tax basis. So that's the benefit of it. Okay. Um, so you said, you know, if you take this plan that you're talking about, um, wait until you get a bill in the mail so you know exactly how much, and then how do you use your card in order to pay for that? So the question is, how do I pay for a bill under the new HSA qualifying plan if I'm waiting for the bill in the mail? So um, typically you can either, um, so I have a plan similar to this. Um, and what happens is you, you really have to wait until the bill comes because you won't know the amount owed. Typically you get your explanation of benefits first and you, you don't really have to do anything with that. But I keep mine and make sure my bill matches the explanation of benefits. And then when I get the bill, you can either call them and give them your credit card information. Um, I, a lot of my doctors, are, you're able to pay right online or you're able to pay um, by filling out the form with your credit card information. You can also pay and be reimbursed if that's easier for you as well. Um, also, what's the difference between a specialist and a spinal manipulation? Is it just a chiropractor versus going to... So a, 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 so a spinal manipulation is chiropractic care, and chi a chiropractor is a specialist, as well as other doctors are specialists. So, um, no, I don't believe so. Uh, what what plan are you looking at? Uh, specialist on uh, let me see. 
I think it's on the uh, personal choice one. The special assistance is forty dollars. So I looked at it wrong there. Okay, it's forty. Uh, special assistance is fifty. Okay, I guess I just that. I and, and sometimes they are, but typically the specialist, the the um, the chiropractic care, physical occupational therapies, those are all considered specialists. Okay, and final question: What is the cost of out-of-pocket costs for retirees for each of these plans? The out-of-pocket, what you pay monthly for them—that's what you'll be getting in the, in the mail. So the costs are not changing too much from current costs which is a good thing, um, and some of these benefits are, are less costly. You will be getting that in the mail before making an election, what the cost is. For those of you that are now in the, in, the, in the part of the presentation where you want to talk to each other, I would ask that you leave and let those that are still paying attention to your person, because the background has gotten really loud. Yes. Okay, so you have to paraphrase uh, the previous slide. Sure. You have the personal C3 F101, and that becomes the new premium plan. Um, and we're going to pay 15% of the premium share plus the difference of the core plan, which is the C4 F302. Do we know what the, the um, difference of the core plan is actually? Or is that already factored into the rates that you have on that? So I haven't showed any cost on here what you're call, what you're paying out of your yes, paycheck. This is, from, this is from our ESS from your job site from next year's plans. That's the cost. So yes. whatever it says under that. Yes. So um, I apologize. So the question is: Are the costs posted on the employee self service website, or do they contain everything? Yes. So what you if you see under monthly and or twenty four pay. That is the, the full cost of the plan. And if you take a look and, and you do go on there, what I was referring to earlier is if you look at the new HSA qualifying plan compared to the other plans, that's when you'll see the cost differential. And when you want to kind of take a look at um, what that cost differential is, because maybe it makes more sense for you to use that cost differential and fund your HSA. And is there like a, a I just find a ridiculous um, the, the, the question is, is there a way to ballpark the difference, the difference between each of the plans? The, so we, we pay the difference, the 50% premium share plus the difference of the core plans. And it's, it's very solid numbers. It's always a wait and see. Just kind of. It's very hard to tell, but I can let you know that in most cases, the plans go up the same percentage. So the, the difference, yeah, so the difference between the plans should remain pretty consistent because we've tried to really line them up so that we can make better decisions in the future. So they sh it should re remain at the same um, differentials. Yes? So you said it's $350 a month for eight, right? And then we have three dollars a month. And I also have like a um, the kind of care. There are two separate accounts. Is it one fee or will it be like $7? So the question is of uh, the fee for the flexible spending account, if you're enrolled in both a flexible spending account and the dependent care account, do you have to pay for two fees? And the answer is no. Um, you just pay one fee. And the fee for that is $3.75 per, per month. Per month? Per month, yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm a so my question is number one, do I enroll in the plan that I want to go with? Or do I enroll in during open enrollment or not? So the question is that um, there is a CRESPA retiree that is, or a CRESPA active employee that is uh, contemplating retiring, and do you enroll now? And I would say yes, enroll, um, because this way, enroll in the plan that you decide, and then um, depending upon when your retirement is and what happens with the union negotiations, you may have to enroll again, given the options. But I would definitely recommend enrolling to make sure that nothing is missed. Um, um. All right, and then my other question is, I was noticing on rates from this current year, for like COBRA, somebody wants to buy a COBRA, which I can't do, single plan, um, but the rates were the same for the same treatment of the plan, the plan would be the same, for both CRESPA and three of those, COBRA rate is the same, if it's the same plan? 
So the question is, the COBRA rate, is it the same for CRESPA and uh, CREA members? And the answer is yes, if it's the same exact plan. So there are some variations that are, we're now moving into in the future um, that may separate them and be a little bit different um, from a prescription drug perspective. And if you have any questions about the actual cost of the plan, you can either see me afterwards or you can give uh, us a call as well and we'll give you the exact figures. Sure. Yes. Are you an employee and spouse? Employee and spouse. So then as you guys say, it's a $25.80. So I'm paying the $3,800 regardless of if I use insurance or not. First of all. So what I'm saying is, so if I, once I need that $3,000 deductible, I have like top of the line health care that, that meets the C3. So once you have, once you meet the $3,000 deductible, all in-network medical expenses are covered at 100%. So you don't pay co-payments like you do in the C3 F101. But all medical expenses are covered at 100%. Yes. Exactly. See, you. I think that maybe you should have given this presentation. That's exactly correct. So, so it really is a movement of, of money, and it's... Correct. Correct, but next year you will also get the opportunity to enroll in whatever plan you'd like. So if next year's costs don't make don't make sense to you, you can enroll in another option. So you're really making a decision for this 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 year. I know that that's hard to do when you're trying to think of long term, but just know that you're not tied into this plan forever and ever. So you can, you can, if you want to, you can. Correct. Exactly. And that's why I, I keep saying, please take a look at the cost you're paying, because a lot of times what we do is we look at the plans and say, oh, a deductible, I don't want that plan. And I can certainly understand why, because it's different than what we're currently used to. But if you really do the math, in some cases, this may be a huge benefit to employees. Um, but it, it, there are there are certain circumstances, like if you're going out of network, where that plan is not is not meant for you. Yes. Sure. No, so you, you had mentioned that you have a child that is um, with Keystone first and is, are you planning on enrolling the child in this plan as well or keeping it separate? So the only thing that I would recommend when it comes to dual coverage is I usually recommend picking the best option that suits that person's need rather than doing dual coverage because what happens with dual coverage is the carriers kind of argue over who's supposed to pay and it ends up just being a nightmare to straighten out and it's easier to just enroll to keep your your child enroll in the plan that's working for him this would be my recommendation and then you can elect what you need for your the remainder of your family but there's no stipulation that um, would prohibit you from that yes um, <laughs> Okay, in the copay 
So, uh, so the question is, how does really prescription drug integrate with the high deductible plan and how does that work if you utilize a lot of prescriptions? And that's a great question. Um, so prescription drugs are now under this, under the HSA qualifying plan, they're subject to the deductible. So when you go to the pharmacy, you're going to be paying the discounted cost of that drug, which can range anywhere from a couple dollars to thousands of dollars, depending upon the prescription. Once, if you're covering any dependents, once you reach $3,000, you no longer pay for the cost of the prescription. It converts over to the co-payments for prescription. All medical services are covered at 100%, but then you pay the co-payments. So the reason why I always say that you can um, predict your exposure is because you're not really going to be exposed to more than that $3,000 other than potential prescription drug um, co-payments, but not the cost of the prescription. Because after you meet the deductible, it reverts back to co-payments. So you can go to the pharmacy and one prescription could potentially meet your deductible depending upon what you're on. But after that point, all your medical services are covered at 100%. So we're setting up feeds between the prescription drug carrier and Blue Cross so that information goes back and forth on a regular basis so that there's really nothing that you need to do. Um, the pharmacy as well as Blue Cross has all that information. Did, did that answer? So the question is, if your spouse turns 65 during the plan year, how does that impact um, the coverage? So the, the way that the maximums are set up are based on eligibility requirements. So if you're just covering you and your spouse, your spouse would only be eligible for contributions for a portion of the year. So we would have to just make sure that you don't go over the maximum allowable IRS contributions that year. He can remain in the plan, but you'll no longer be able to contribute the, the, the um, family contributions. You'll be then reverted back to single contributions. He can still re remain in the plan, but as it relates to the health savings account, it's, it, the criteria is contributions only for you. So he can still use the plan, but as far as the maximum that we went through, the 3,500 for single and 7,000, that's the maximum allowable contributions that anyone can contribute for a year. We just have to make sure that you don't go over that. So we can work with you directly just to make sure. So it's calculated based on a monthly basis. So you have to take the maximum divided by 12. And then um, if, it, if, if he turns 65 in August, then he would be eligible for eight months. But your plan is, the, the deductible is so low compared to the maximum. I don't think you're ever going to meet that maximum threshold of, um, when I'm talking about maximum, I'm talking about the annual contribution that members are allowed to contribute. So if you want to, even though the deductible is only $1,500 for single, you can contribute up to $3,500 a year. So that's what I'm referring to. But since your deductibles are so low, I don't think it's going to have a negative impact on you. But we can do the calculation for you and just make sure. Sure. Yes. Yes. Typically, it's two cards. Um, we'll I will double check on that, but typically, it's two cards, and you can order more if you need it. But typically, it's two cards. Yes. So if you elect to, for the for the FSA, you elect what you want to come out of your paycheck for the year, and that money is available to you up front. That's for the medical FSA. The dependent care it, is different. Now, the, uh, Sure. So, so the question is with the flexible spending account, what if the doctor and the pharmacy doesn't um, uh, accept cards, uh, debit cards or, or HSA or FSA cards, and you are able to pay and then submit for reimbursement? The cards are really meant to just be um, easier to utilize, but uh, years ago, all you could do was reimbursement. So you're still able to do that now if you want to. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Yeah. So um, the, 
the question is, are you able to adjust the amount for the flexible spending? And the answer is no. So what you elect for the year is what you are, unless you have a qualifying life event. And that the reason is because it's a, a pre-tax benefit. So you have to kind of come up with what you think you're going to have. But keep in mind this year for the flexible spending account, $500 is going to roll over if it's remaining. So starting September, uh, starting July 1st, 2019, um, you can elect, you can kind of, you don't have to be as conservative with your election because any unused amount, you can roll over up to 500 for next year. Yes. First of all, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so nice of you to say. Thank you. So anybody who elects this on the 1st of September, that money that the district is going to give is in their account. So, so the, I would say that um, it'll be there in the first week of September. And the reason is because the IRS stipulates you have to have that deductible plan. You have to be enrolled in it first. Okay. So the funding is not going to take place until the first or second day of September. Okay. Um, it typically takes about two business days to get into everyone's account. But I always say... If you have prescriptions that you have to fill and you're moving into the high deductible plan, fill them the month before if, if possible. Because then this way, you that's a really the only thing you have to worry about. If you go to the doctor or the hospital, you're not going to be billed up front. They're going to send you a bill. So you don't have to worry about making payments there. The only time you're really going to need that card up front is at the pharmacy. So if you can just plan ahead and make sure that your prescriptions are filled and sometimes I know we can't do that but if there are any issues where you think that the only time you can fill a prescription is that first week in September give us a call and we'll help but it is the, the district money is going in first so that people can count on that that would be yes okay yes. that was just it's been a good question oh okay okay so again you're retiree and the district's not paying any money into your card and um, you have $1,500 deductible, do you even need a card? So the question is, if you're a retiree and, you have, um, and you're have and you moving into the deductible plan, do you need a health savings account card? You don't, you don't have to use the health savings account. You lose some of the tax benefits because you're not, it's not coming out of your you know, paycheck pre-tax, but you can still put money aside on that card. Right, right. So you don't necessarily need that card. You can, you'll get the card automatically and you'll have the account automatically, but you don't necessarily need the card if you don't so want it. when you say 1500 deductible, say I go to the doctor, the chiropractor, whatever, and I spent $800 for the year. I never met that 1500 Do I have to now give them $700 because I never met the 1500 No, the question is, is if you don't meet the deductible during the plan year, what happens to the remainder of the deductible? It just, uh, it, the deductible restarts over again that next plan year. And the deductible runs from September to August so that you can make a decision every year as to what plan you want to use. But um, if you just use $800 in expenses, then that's all, you'll just be subject to the discounted cost of services. Keep in mind on the medical side too, the good thing about these plans, um, and I don't anticipate many people having to do this, but if God forbid you went into the hospital and you're subject to the full 1500 and you can't pay for it all at once, all of the providers are set up payment plans. So it's not as if you're going to be out all this money um, up front. You can pay on, on, on payment plans. I know that's not ideal, but there really isn't going to be a situation when you're, you're going to, unless you have a very expensive prescription, that's the only time you may have to come up with the full amount up front. Most payment plans charge interest? Uh, the question is, do most payment plans charge interest? And the answer is no. Um, from my experience, no. And if you ever need help with um, setting up payment plans, we are, all, you know, we're we're more than happy to help. I don't anticipate that happening because your deductible is relatively low. Um, again, I have a six thousand dollar deductible, and then um, so so I have set up payment plans before, um, and it actually automatically comes out of my health savings account. But I don't get um, as much funding and everything from that, so it it behoo behooves me. But it, you probably won't need it in this scenario. Yes. So the question is the flexible spending account that we have now, they don't charge a monthly fee and that's correct. They don't charge a fee, but they're actually no longer um, in business. 
and that may be because they don't charge a fee because <laughs> the fee really covers the cost of the card and just administering the program. So, oh. so uh, I just want to uh, re um, Christine just mentioned that the fee does not apply to CRESPA. Okay. <laughs> so this fee does not apply to it because it's not in, um, in your agreement. So it does not apply. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Kristen for such an informative and great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>